February 15th, 2021. While an ongoing pandemic, a capital insurrection, and the second impeachment trial gripped the nation, Texans remember 215-21 for reasons beyond national headlines. In the very early hours of the, of the morning that Monday, winter storm Yuri hit. So uh, for over 4 million homes across the southwest U.S. lost power and heat, in some cases for days on end, then record-breaking sub-freezing temperatures. Water pipes froze. Grocery store chains were forced to ration water and fuel. In some cases, electric bills rose as high as $17,000. And most importantly, 246 people across the state died during the storm or in the months that followed from storm-related complications. I had moved to Washington, D.C. from Austin just six months before Winter Storm Yuri. And I remember frantically refreshing my feeds, looking for any bit of news about the storm that was headed straight for everyone I had just left behind. After days without electricity and heat and on a boil water advisory, which is unusual for a developed country with modern plumbing, a pipe burst in my family's home and flooded it. I was 1,300 miles away and could do nothing about it at all. But the helplessness that I felt paled in comparison to the eight months that they spent displaced from our home. Even so, we were among the lucky ones. Others faced total destruction of their homes, loss of loved ones, and other immeasurable hardships in the storm's wake. In the months that followed Yuri, I decided to break the cold that oil and gas had on my career. I knew that I could contribute most significantly to the energy transition from right here at home in Texas. Yuri ultimately brought me back to Texas, but before I could even get to that point, we need to understand what happened. A year and a half out from Yuri, many people are still confused about what happened or what hasn't happened, for lack of a better word. Since Yuri was the first time that most people, let alone Texans, even heard of ERCOT, rumors spread really quickly about who or what was to blame for the fallout. ERCOT started trending on social media, actually, in the days after Governor Abbott and Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick uh, spoke about their coordination with ERCOT and its governing agency, the Public Utility Commission of Texas. I should also say ERCOT stands for the Electric Reliability Council of Texas. They operate the grid. And that's who most people blamed for this fallout, but we'll, we'll get to that later. We're not ready for that yet. And at the same time, mainstream news outlets even published articles explaining the Texas grid and its power market structure. If Yuri taught us anything, it's that blissful ignorance concerning our energy mix just wasn't a luxury that we could afford anymore. Since coming back to Texas, I've watched how lawmakers have handled the disaster. First, state officials took to national news platforms and uh, social media to wrongfully blame renewables for the fallout. Then, the governor fired the CEO of ERCOT and all three public utility commissioners. In the weeks that followed Yuri, the legislature held multiple days of hearings for regulators to testify about what happened. And finally, after months of deliberation, the legislature ultimately passed a few bills to address the issue, but few actually had enough teeth to truly protect and repair the grid. So what did happen during URI? It boils down to three core issues, beginning with poor planning and weather modeling on ERCOT's part. ERCOT undercut their own estimation of just how low temperatures would fall and when winter storm URI would hit. Second, Inadequate critical infrastructure froze over under such low winter temperatures and such extreme conditions that it wasn't accustomed to, taking many generation resources offline. And finally, ERCOT is designed to be isolated. Because it bears no interconnection with other state or regional grids, it jeopardizes our grid's resilience, making us that much more vulnerable. ERCOT's poor planning and forecasting, like I said, underestimated how low they knew temperatures were going to drop during URI and when the storm would actually hit. Generators across the energy resource spectrum froze, but it was truly poor planning that escalated the situation. Every single day, uh, the grid operators have to balance the power available to the grid and demand by keeping it at its requisite frequency of 60 hertz. It's for this reason that few people really understand how dangerously unstable the grid became and how fragile it still is. Because around 2 a.m. the morning of February 15th, the grid's frequency dropped to 59.3 hertz. Seems like a marginal difference, right? Seems like it wouldn't make a difference. It did. Had it stayed underneath that 60 hertz threshold for only just a few minutes more, the grid would have collapsed entirely. In fact, we were four minutes and 37 seconds away from that, that point. Had that happened, Texans would have lived months, days, weeks, even without power. And ERCOT would have had to take on the grueling process of what's called a black start, which is bringing resources back online very slowly and very cautiously. So to, pre to prevent a grid collapse, they actually implemented a practice called load shedding. It's an emergency practice that requires shutting off parts of the grid in order to lower total demand. 
We can best understand this as a train that just saw one of its larger engines fail. Bear with me here. Rather than allowing the entire train to come to a stop entirely, operators could choose to detach a few cars and allow the rest of the train to keep continuing at its original speed while the car with the failed engine slows to a stop. Therefore, it doesn't derail the entire thing. But at the same time, operators didn't really seem to have a plan or a pattern in mind when they started implementing this. Others, there were, there were some who experienced no outages at all whatsoever during the storm, while others lost power for days. So clearly there was no rhyme or reason to which parts of the grid they were shutting off. Second, our inadequate energy infrastructure buckled under such extreme winter storm conditions. As they currently stand, transmission towers and generation facilities and more are all exposed to the elements. Retrofitting them is going to be expensive. I won't, I won't lie about it. And Abbott's response to URI was a push to winterize our energy infrastructure, which ultimately led the Texas legislature to pass Senate Bill 3 during the 2021 Texas legislative session. Under this legislation, the Public Utility Commission, the PUC, has to mandate that generation companies weatherize their assets in preparation for extreme weather events. This, they also require that ERCOT regularly inspect these assets and report any violations to the, to the PUC, its governing body. But at the same time, this bill really lacked the teeth to do anything, like I said, and it remains to be seen in the 2023 session that's gonna begin this January if anything is really going to change, if they're going to pass any stronger legislation that's actually going to make a difference. And as you might expect, not everybody has taken the call for weatherization so seriously. During a West Texas natural gas plant tour in December, an oil and, great, an oil and gas trade association spokesperson spoke confirmed that the industry has actually made no winterization upgrades since URI whatsoever. He instead claimed that they'd already been doing that for years. They've already been preparing their assets for cold. He instead said that keeping the power on is the best winterization tool we have. Okay, but Yuri taught us, if anything, that power can't flow through frozen infrastructure in the first place, so it doesn't really work, does it? And even worse, this wasn't even the first time it happened. Just 10 years ago, 2011, the state suffered rolling blackouts lasting anywhere between 20 minutes and eight hours. We wasted 10 years. We had a warning 10 years ago to fix the weaknesses in our energy infrastructure system that Yuri had pointed, or that, I'm sorry, the blackouts had pointed out. And at the same time, we paid the price for it in 2021. How can we expect to be prepared for the next extreme weather event in 2031 and beyond if we keep up with this pattern? And finally, like I said, uh, ERCOT is designed to be isolated. You might be wondering why neighboring states who were similarly affected by URI seem to recover from the outages much more quickly than we did. And that's because it actually it goes, it goes back to not necessarily federal versus state politics in the current sense, but actually to how ERCOT was designed. 75 years ago, when ERCOT was established, they actually designed the grid very specifically to be isolated in order to skirt federal interference and keep it within state jurisdiction. But you might be wondering, okay, out of those you know, over four million houses across the Southwest US that lost power during URI, how many were in Texas? 3.5 million. There's no reason for that. You might wonder why the federal government didn't interfere. Like I said, it's by design. ERCOT is what's called an independent system operator, otherwise known as an ISO. Other grids are organized regionally, called regional transmission organizations, and they share power between different states. Whereas ERCOT delivers power to 90% of the state. You can see a little, bit over, a little bit of overlap here in the panhandle with the Southwest Power Pool, but for the most part, 90% of the state is served by ERCOT. So our neighbors like Oklahoma and Kansas saw similar outages, but at the same time, they they paled in comparison to what we went through. And that's because their energy mix is, is quite diverse and spans across 14 states, meaning that power generated in one SPP state, Southwest Power Pool, can be, can be shared and distributed to consumers in another SPP state. It's interesting because former Governor Rick Perry actually said during the week of the storm that Texans would rather go longer than three days without electricity than have the federal government in their business. I don't know about you, but I'll just let you sit with that for a second. When lawmakers dismiss, or when they defend their inaction, they dismiss the very human side of the toll that Yuri took on all of us. 
They seem to forget that the 246 Texans we lost were treasured friends and family members. Parents desperate to keep their children safe and warm turned on their car engines or even brought charcoal grills inside their homes, exposing their families to carbon monoxide. Others died from hypothermia, car crashes, and other chronic illnesses that were further complicated by a lack of access to running water, reliable power, and extreme temperatures. Abbott says that the grid is stronger than ever. I don't believe it, do you? But he says that the grid is stronger than ever, but at the same time, we're ignoring a broader issue of our over-reliance on natural gas and other fossil fuels. Because of ERCOT's poor weather forecasting, they actually allowed natural gas plants to be taken offline days before URI. We were already unprepared, in other words. Days before URI, these natural gas plants were taken offline for scheduled maintenance. Meaning that for a state that relies on natural gas for 47% of its energy consumption, this was a major problem. And those, who, those critics who dismiss renewables as weak and unreliable, too unreliable to really bolster grid resilience, seem to forget that solar saved the grid this, just this past summer. As we cranked down our ACs to stay cool this summer, Texas solar production reached record highs. Even when West Texas wind underperformed, just as forecasted, its Gulf Coast counterparts pick up, picked up the slack. It, just shows, it goes to show that extreme heat can put just as much pressure on the grid as extreme cold. Interconnection with other state grids would allow our renewable power mix to be shared at a larger level. An October 2021 study from Stanford showed that in an electrified economy, renewables can bolster grid resilience uh, when islanded ISOs like ERCOT are connected to neighboring grids. This also will require significant investment up front. I won't sugarcoat it. But renewables have proven themselves time and time again as worthy investments, as now they're among the cheapest resources today, whereas they were some of the most expensive just 10 years ago. Yuri showed us that climate change isn't the far-off dystopia we want to think it is. We ignored the warnings of 2011, and we paid the price in 2021. We simply can't afford to look back in 2031 and think about what we could have done differently. So you may be asking, what can we do about it? So let's talk about ways that you, individually and personally, can push for a stronger grid and a brighter tomorrow. And we'll start by saying, to seize emerging opportunities in the clean energy, in the energy sector, just like I did. Total energy employment in the U.S. rose 4% from 2020 to 2021, outpacing general U.S. labor growth during the same time period, which rose only 2.8%. Yes, our, the Texas energy workforce is concentrated in the fuel subsector. But it's important to note that the yearly changes in employment based on generation type, it's important to know how they compare to each other. The boom and bust cadence of the oil and gas sector takes a toll on workers and their families, but the energy transition offers them an opportunity to shift their expertise into a steady and booming clean energy sector. Wind and solar generation employment towers over the others, as you can see here, and that is because renewable energy companies require all the same types of workers that oil and gas companies do. So that's welders, construction workers, uh, environmental scientists, policy analysts, um, and so many other types of workers. But in order to foster a successful energy transition, it has to be equitable. As the future generation of change makers in this state, we can only move forward if we don't leave anyone behind. And second, you can vote. No, you have to vote. We, it's, time to it's time to invoke the changes that we've demanded for over a year. Vote out the candidates who chose to do nothing about the grid rather than rock the, rock the boat. Take them out of office. Support candidates who present very workable solutions to the impacts of climate change that are only slated to worsen in the, t in the decades to come. Find your polling place. Take your friends and family with you to cast your midterm votes. Take advantage of early voting. And make sure that your voice is heard. Right now, Texas is faced with a unique opportunity to call the shots as we hope to rise as a leader in the energy transition. We have the tools to do so already. We're already a leader in renewable energy production. We already have a skilled energy workforce. But, as you may remember, we lack leaders who prioritize people and planet over politics. It's the leaders who prioritize industries that buy their interests that are holding us back. Texas takes pride in being a trailblazer among its peers. And we have the opportunity now to change our energy destiny. So I ask you, and I leave you with this, if you take pride in being a Texan for those very reasons, take action. Protect each other and for future generations with your vote and your voice. Thank you. Thank you.